Workers in the oil and gas industry have the potential to be exposed to several different types of hazards. The consequences of exposure are significant to workers, companies, the industry, and the entire economy. We'll talk with a safety professional with deep expertise in the oil and gas industry on this episode of the Psych Health and Safety USA podcast. From Flourish DX, this is the Psych Health and Safety USA podcast. Safety at work is more than freedom from physical injury. To be safe, you have to feel safe. Join us each week as we discuss psychologically healthy and safe work in the USA. Welcome to this week's Psych Health and Safety USA podcast. I'm your host, Dr. I. David Daniels, and I want to thank you for tuning in each week we seek to increase awareness of the importance of psychological health and safety by learning from the lived experiences, research, and expertise of our guests, as well as advocating strategies to reduce harm and minimize vulnerability to psychosocial hazards in the American workplace. Oil and gas account for approximately 3% of the gross domestic product of this entire planet. Petroleum products produced, uh, or things that are produced from petroleum products, I should say, uh, actually can be found virtually everywhere, from the PPE that we talk about as safety professionals to packaging and things like aspirin and clothing and fuel for transportation. Even solar panels have petroleum products in them. So workers in this industry are exposed to a range of potential hazards at different stages of production, whether they be on the electrical lines, using heavy equipment, or working around flammable gases. They are also exposed to things like time pressure, uh, harsh environmental conditions, and even isolation from friends and family. Each of these can affect not only their physical, but their mental health. In an environment that can place workers at risk, it's really important that we ensure that safety is not just about rules and regulations and preventive measures, but it's also a foundation, it's a value, and it's something that's deeply embedded in the organization's culture. Today's guest, Jim Junkin, is the CEO of Mariner Gulf Consulting and Services, LLC. It's a Louisiana-based environmental safety, health, and risk management firm. It was founded in response to the 2010 Deepwater Horizon disaster. I'm sure we'll have some conversation about that incident as we talk uh, in this episode. And uh, I'd like to welcome my guest by a very simple but direct question. So who is James Junkin? James Junkin is a complicated person, according to my friends, family, and especially my spouse. But it is an honor, an honor to be here, Dr. Daniels. I, I, I can't tell you how proud I am of the work that you are doing and the folks that are championing mental health, psychological health as as part of a total occupational safety and health management system. So many times we focus on the physical, the physical health, and I don't want to diminish that. But in the past, maybe we've not given as much uh, emphasis to the psychological health, uh, creating an environment of psychological safety within our safety management systems, and, you know, we're not looking at the total well-being of, of the entire worker. And in an industry like the oil and gas industry, that can end up with deadly consequences. So uh, just a little bit about me and to answer your question more directly, uh, Mariner Gulf is a occupational safety and health consulting firm. I've been um, in occupational safety and health consulting for about 13 years now. Uh, I'm a been affiliated with with Veriforce and uh, Legacy PEC Safety, which is a huge uh, contractor risk management type firm um, with supply chain uh, uh, supply chain solutions and stuff within the oil and gas industry. So I grew up in the oil and gas industry. I think I understand um, the hazards in the industry, and and my goal is to help workers get home safe from high hazard jobs, and that means not only in a physical stance but also a psychological good psychological position. Wow. Wow. Uh, I, now I have to say as a, as a, as a city dweller, uh, I'm one of those folks who, what I know about oil and gas is, uh, could probably be put in a thimble. 
Uh, so I, I, I intend to learn as much as possible from you and, and have been learning and the opportunities we've had to work together. Um, so, t- so tell me a little bit about when you hear psychological health and safety, just in general, what is that? If you were to define that for somebody or, or put that in a way that folks in the oil and gas industry understood what that meant, how would you describe that to people? Well, I think initially when, I, when this first came out, when I was being trained as a, a, a safety professional, and I have a degree in occupational safety and health, uh, serve on a lot of committees um, in the field, still practicing as a safety professional, you know, our training was around rules, regulations, compliance, um, creating culture, if you will. Sometimes I don't like the term safety culture, it kind of pigeonholed it. We can have that discussion too. Uh, but we really didn't delve into the things that help make that culture go, that help workers not only be compliant, but have safe work practices to avoid uh, at-risk behaviors. And as psychological safety became more of a hot-button topic in the last two years, as a safety consultant, the first thing you think of is mental health, you know, mental health. And I don't want to diminish mental health. We have a mental health crisis going on in this nation. And COVID didn't help it. Uh, Coming as a veteran from the veteran community, we lose 22 veterans a day to suicide. So I'm very sensitive to mental health and people getting the mental health resources that they need. I was raised in the old school where people told you, just suck it up. Suck it up, do better. So we see what that 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 process, that ideology has resulted in, uh, particularly in the veteran community. But psychological safety is so much more than just mental health. It's so much more than just dealing with depression. It's creating an environment where people feel safe at work. And what do I mean by feel safe? They feel safe to point out hazards. They feel safe to point out deficiencies within the management system. They feel safe to approach their supervisor. They feel safe to stop the job. You know, we always in safety try to emphasize stop work authority and in some cases stop work obligation. Well, that doesn't come across and that doesn't get implemented and hazards don't get controlled and hazardous situations uh, continue to evolve because people don't feel safe from it. And and you can have all the legal protections you want, but as an individual, I have a family to feed, I have bills to pay, I have outside influences, and and I wanna do a good job, I'm trying to meet my expectations. So psychological safety to me is creating an environment where people feel safe to do their jobs the best they can, to voice challenges, and to get positive reinforcement for management. And really what it all comes down to is the same thing comes down to general occupational safety and health. Management gets the culture it deserves. Hmm. Okay. I've said that on other podcasts. Wow. So if you're not thinking about psychological safety and health as part of your overall safety management system, you're going to get the culture you deserve. And you got to have more than compliance. That's right. That's right. So so let's... Let's dig a little bit into uh, what what drives some of the things that you said. The thing that's impressed me about just getting to meet you is how passionate you are about this. And that you don't come across as a guy who stumbled into safety last week and is out there just, uh, you know, spouting slogans. You really I mean, it, it comes across in just everything that you say and how passionate you are. So what led you to to the safety profession in general. How did you end up being a safety dude? Well, I, st- I started out, believe it or not, uh, as an executive in the oil and gas industry, a small, small oil company in Alabama, Trico Oil Company. Uh, started out in sales and marketing, worked my way to president and CEO of that organization. So back then, I didn't have the same view of safety that I have now. Safety back then was like, don't get hurt. And it's common sense or it's part of the job in in the 90s and sort of reared in the old school. Uh, But I I started thinking about processes and production and how to improve quality. And then I went to work for Mercedes-Benz U.S. International as part of their management team. And that's where I learned that to make things about processes, not necessarily about people. Now, 
what they mean is not that people don't matter. People matter. People are our production engine. Without people, we don't produce. But if if all of our processes are in in uh, Jimmy's head or Sarah's head, when they leave the organization, we don't have any processes. And I was geared up into that, and it made sense to me. Hey, let's make things about processes, not about people. And right now, in the oil and gas industry and across industries as a whole, we're seeing an uptick in serious injuries and fatalities. Why? One of the contributing factors, I think, is we didn't have good processes. Our processes were in people's heads when they left the organization, the process left with them. And now we have this great migration of new workers with different skills, different experiences, but maybe not in the exact framework that our previous employment had. And, and it's creating it's creating serious incidents and accident potential within the framework. But here's how I stumbled into safety. So I formed a management consulting company. I, I had been many years looking at consulting, you know, Uh, I'd hired a lot of consultants and I said, you know, maybe I could offer some value. And uh, we started Mariner Golf in in New Orleans, Louisiana, as a management process consulting, helping companies get their um, organization right for growth, accounts receivable, streamline, debt restructuring, whatever. And our typical customer was someone in the oil and gas industry, a contractor with 100 or less employees. And when we came across those, they said, this is great, James. We, we like that leadership training, all that. But what we really need help with is we have all these pre-qualification systems we have to deal with. Have you ever heard of IS Network, PEC Safety? And back then, I said, never. But I could learn to do that, and we can make that part of our service. So everywhere I went, people were like, we need somebody to do a safety meeting. We need somebody to uh, do some training. So I went to the OSHA Outreach Center, learned how to be an instructor, uh, started going back to school, got a degree in occupational safety and health, and happened to be at the right place at the right time when the BP oil spill hit. Mm. And that was my first launch into uh, big time what I call real safety. So, so, so let me make sure I understand this. So you're telling me that uh, a, a guy who was your typical CEO focused on production, focused on, you know, making, you know, obviously making a good profit, uh, gets into a really big multinational corporation. Uh, your, your mindset changes a little bit. You start looking at safety and your first incident is the BP oil spill. That was my first major incident. So share a little bit about what that was like. Well, I was living in New Orleans at the time. And I would like to say my my response to it was all altruistic. But when I saw the, the rig sink, I said, they're going to need thousands of responders. Mm-hmm. There's no way they're going to cap this well. Uh, as deep as it is, as complicated as it is. And if you go back in time a little bit, remember the ROV that set off the uh, 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 off the uh, um, coast of Louisiana? It was an underwater vessel, and it, it shot a real-time cam. You had the deep water horizon cam. You just saw the crude oil uh, just, yes. just coming out continuously from the riser. Sure. When I saw that, I said, that water's coming to the beach, and we're going to have to clean it up. And I happened to be associated with then at PEC Safety at the time. And uh, I said, they're going to need a lot of instructors. And they happened to call me and ask me to be an instructor. And I went down to Orange Beach, Alabama. Mm. And uh, we trained 150,000 responders in the first um, 90 days and 300,000 within the year. Wow. And I think I personally trained over 30,000 as oil spill responders. And I found a passion for it. Before that, it was just something we added on as another um, offering for our business. But but over the years, I've just become very passionate about getting workers home safe. And, and here's why. I might be a white-collar worker now, if there is such a thing. But I got blue-collar roots. Mm. All of my family has worked in the coal mines, in logging, manufacturing facilities in the military and that's the folks that get hurt that's right you know i remember my dad having a messed up back from working all those years and and many times he he would struggle to stand 
mm. uh, and be in intense pain and have to take to bed for periods of time. That's who I'm working for because it's personal. It's personal. And we've just added that to our to our company offerings ever since. Uh, I have worked fatality investigations. We're coming up on the year anniversary uh, in December of a of a fatality that we had in North Dakota seven days before Christmas. Wow. And when you when you deal with this on the individual level and you see the impact of a safety management system failure on the family, on fellow employees, on the CEO, mm. you start to realize what we do matters. And when we fail, we usually fail in somebody's blood. Wow. Wow. You know, I I, uh, I have to admit that I don't, I don't run across a lot of people who, uh, who actually are, uh, I wouldn't say they aren't as passionate, but who describe this in the way that you just did. But I, I feel very similar. Uh, I've not had family members that have been injured and killed at work, but my own experience predominantly in the fire rescue service was I have seen my colleagues, you know, people that I, so I go to an incident with you, I come back without you. And uh, we, a lot of times described ourselves just like family. But what you said is, I think, so important when we talk about safety, just safety in general, whether it be biological, chemical, ergonomic, whatever type of safety we're talking about, that is that you make this personal. Because sometimes I wonder, I wonder what happens to people that don't take it personal anymore, that don't consider how this decision they're getting ready to make is going to affect people. Uh, so, I mean, and being in a, in such a, you know, having had relatives and whatnot who've been affected by this, what's, I, I, I'm a, I want to assume, I should say, that some of the folks you've talked to in the oil and gas industry don't agree with you. Or, or have you just gotten lucky and run into a bunch of folks who, get this and think it's it, fine. So what's the reaction that you get from people in the traditional systems when that, you that bring up this great. level of passion? That is great. There's not a CEO out there that will tell you that they don't care whether people get hurt or not. Okay. I think in the mindset of procurement, of operations, of executives, They don't think it's very likely to happen to them. Mm. I know many of our customers that we deal with that have had serious injuries and fatalities. The likelihood that that incident was going to happen was very, very small. It took the sun, the moon, the stars, all this to align to have this incident. And it may never align again. So from a risk management standpoint, they weren't prepared because they didn't think it could happen. To a person, in my experience, after it happens, we always recommend the chief executive officer get counseling. Mm. Uh, in the incident I'm referring to in November, I really thought the CEO of that company was almost suicidal. They hmm. took so much ownership. And when you're doing an investigation, you're looking for all the causal factors. What did the employee do? And I'm not a big fan of blaming the employee. Usually the employee is the last person in the line if you want to start blaming. Uh, blame is not, I'm not into blame. You know where blame gets assigned? The courtroom. Hmm. I'm here to find out what happened and put countermeasures in place where it doesn't happen again. But after these incidences, it becomes so obvious, so obvious as to what failed, you know. Um, and it's easy to start trying to blame people uh, for failures and make attributions after the fact. Sometimes it's harder to do that when you're in the process. You can't see the forest for the trees. So in my experiences, it usually takes a tragic incident near 
or closely associated with companies sometimes to get senior management to understand the importance of investing in a safety management system beyond mere compliance with either their hiring clients they're working for or the OSHA regulations. I like to tell people this. If all you do is comply with OSHA, OSHA will get you killed. Mm. OSHA says I can be within 10 feet of a power line that's 50,000 volts. James Junkin not going to be within 10 feet of a power <laughs> line that's 50,000 volts. I don't even understand it, electricity. It's magic, Dr. Daniels. How, how does electricity <laughs> work? I don't know. Right. I don't know. Right. But getting back to, to your question, that's where sharing education, uh, senior management, talking to their, their competitors, talking to their equivalents on a leadership basis, sharing their experiences. Because once it happens, and I'm going to include myself in this, only you and the man in the mirror and the man upstairs know whether you did everything you could do. Mm. And if you're dealing with serious injuries and fatalities, something failed. And it's wow. generally the system. Wow. 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 I, I you know, it, it's a, I, I guess one of these days I'm going to become a more professional podcast host because sometimes I get so transfixed by what the folks are saying, in this case, what you're saying, that I forget that we need to continue to talk about it. But wow, I, I, I've had, uh, again, personally uh, been involved in some, uh, some fatalities, you know, at work, as I said, you know, colleagues of mine uh, that, you know, I was there when they, you know, pulled their lifeless body out. And I'll never forget those. And again, being in fire rescue, I've, I've seen lots and lots and lots of people uh, find their demise. And what you said really struck me when people die, uh, and particularly when they die at work, the first thing to blame really is the system. And it's, but it's unfortunate that we get just the opposite most of the time, at least my experience. You're we, right. get the, we get the finger pointing and generally we point the finger at the person who had the least ability to change things, which is a worker. Generally they have, there are, again, I'm not suggesting that they don't have some involvement in, sometimes in their own demise, but often they are doing what they were told to do or doing what the system allowed them to do. And, you know, they ultimately suffer the consequence, but there's somebody or a system, you know, up the line that could have, you know, created a safer environment for them on the, on the, on the physical side. So how do you deal with the folks who tell you that, you know, that <laughs> safety stuff, that safety stuff just costs too much? Because that's you know the what, argument that I hear often is, you, it, well, you, you know, know what cost? Let me tell you what cost. Dead people cost. Okay. Litigation cost. Your reputation cost. Nobody wants to do business, particularly in the oil and gas industry, uh, with companies that are unsafe. Mm -hmm. There's all sorts of award criteria for work. And fatalities will definitely, from a business side, uh, negate you in many cases from future work. So take the moralistic side of this out of, out of the equation, just deal with the business side. I do not know of a company in my 25 years of, of working, almost 30 years of being an executive, that has poor safety record that exceeds in production and quality. Okay? Okay. Now, this is going to shock some of my safety colleagues. Safety is not number one. Okay? Our output is not safety. We do not come to work for safety. We come to work to produce. But safety is equivalent to production and quality because safety impacts production and quality. You want to stop production? Get somebody seriously injured. Mm. Get somebody killed. Have an explosion. Uh, shut down a pipeline. Shut down a construction project. Shut down your manufacturing. So it all works together in type of a system. Safety, production, and quality are the legs in which the company stands on. They're the stool. They're the support. They're the foundation. Any one of those has 
malignancies in it, it affects the other. So I try to explain it in, in, those, in those terms. Litigation cost. Your reputation as an industry, as a, as a leader in industry and someone we want to work with from a risk standpoint, that cannot be undone. So if you just don't care about your workers, okay, then care about the production quality and safety from a standpoint that it makes good business sense. Nothing costs like an accident, a serious accident. And we've done a good job, Dr. Daniels, as an industry, of driving down OSHA recordable injuries. You know, anything that requires treatment beyond first aid, uh, you know, stitches and sprains and things. We've done a really good job of that. But we still kill between five and 6,000 people at work every year. Hmm. Right. Now, if you want to equate that, in the war, and I like to equate things back to my military experience. I'm a Navy veteran, and, and during the war on terror that started in 2001 and continued until, I guess, we withdrew from Afghanistan last year. In the entirety of that conflict, less than 7,000 servicemen died in active combat. Now, each one of those is a tragedy. Each one of those is a folded up American flag that went home in honor to a family who mourns their loss and a nation who should be comforting of their sacrifice. But Dr. Daniels, we kill that many at work every year, every year. And what I'm passionate about is where's the outrage? Where is the outrage? If we lost 7,000 members of the armed forces in combat, the American people would march on Washington and burn the White House down no matter who was in it. They wouldn't stand for it. But we will allow that to happen in the workplaces in America where we're not going into combat. We're going to work. And too many times those workers are not coming back home. So what I'm challenging people to do is to reject the status quo that this just happens. It doesn't have to just happen. We can fix this. We can change this. It's going to take some leadership. It's going to take people coming together and acknowledging that we have a problem. It's going to take quit having moralistic judgments after the fact, okay, and say we had a failure. Let's find out. Let's work on a system in which people can work and quit saying things like this. Well, James, that sounds great, but you don't understand the workers that I have to work with. You know, hmm. what about bad apples? You ever get that one, Dr. Daniels? I, what about I, I bad do. apples? Yeah, I, I do. I do. Who who said the apple was bad? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Who, 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 who said that there are a lot of things you can do with apples that even have bruises on them? They, they make great applesauce and pies and all kinds of preserves and all kinds of things. So don't tell me the apple was bad. I, 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 I believe I reject that concept. <laughs> so me, me, me too. Yeah. Look, you're asking me to define why a person did what they did. I can't tell you, Dr. Daniels, why people do what they do. Hell, I can't even tell you why people ask me that question. <laughs> so for the last 35 years, we have been trying to get into the minds of workers. And we've tried to motivate. We've tried to change their attitudes. We've tried to influence their behaviors with slogans and all these things. And then after there's an incident, we send them back to retraining without ever looking at the system in which they work in. It's the system. Yes, yes. Yeah, we, we call that fundamental attribution error where we pay a lot of attention to the person and pay virtually no attention to the environment. And, and, and so, this, so this discussion leads me to uh, the connection between psychological health and safety and these terrible disasters, these tragedies where people lose their lives. I am of the belief, because I don't have all the research to back this up. I do have some, but not all the research to back this up, that virtually every uh, line of duty uh, you know, at work fatality 
that there was a psychosocial hazard or a psychosocial risk that got ignored. That, that's honestly what I believe, because if we did the investigation all the way back to what was in the mind of the person at the time, what was the environment at the time that we put the person in, uh, we wouldn't simply stop right there and say, well, they didn't put their gloves on. Well, why didn't they put their gloves on? Why, why did first did they even have a pair of gloves available to them? Or did we tell them that, uh, you know, you got to go buy your own at the hardware store? That even if they'd had that particular glove on, that glove wasn't uh, consistent with the risk we we're trying to protect them from anyway. So there are all of these, you know, uh, actually just ways that we think about things and ways that we feel about things that get ignored when the worker tells us, you know, this really doesn't fit or this doesn't work for me or I don't really understand. When we ignore that, we are setting ourselves and setting the organization up for something really bad to happen down the road. So talk a little bit, of, you know, you've done uh, these fatality investigations, serious incident. Talk a little bit about the emotions that are involved. Uh, well, why don't we start with the emotions of just the people that are doing the investigation? I live with a lot of ghosts. I. I've never told this to anybody, but I keep the obituaries of all the people that have died that I've done their investigation. And I keep them in my Bible as a reminder of how serious this is. So one of the worst just happened to be last year because it was Christmas. Seven days before Christmas, there's an explosion kills one worker, seriously injures another. Uh, the one that was seriously injured, it happened in a shop. He's running all over the shop area. It's all on video. Uh, blood trails all over. Um, I don't want to be too graphic, but you can imagine uh, what happened to the victim uh, in the explosion through a shop door into the snow uh, outside. Seven days before Christmas. Guy was supposed to go home the next day. The next day to his family. Two little little children, uh, two little girls, uh, preschool age. Instead of Santa Claus, they got their dad home in a box with an American flag over it. He was a Marine that served two tours in Afghanistan. And that had a Tremendous effect on me from a psychological standpoint because it is outrageous that you survived the combat of Afghanistan to come home and die at work. Okay. So you always look back as to what your actions were and how you can how you can change, what you can do to make things better. Where did you fail in the process as an investigator? Uh, if you were involved in the incident, because a lot of times these investigations are done by in-house safety professionals. And usually we're the ones responsible, at least for the maintenance of the safety management system. Uh, some of my team worked very directly in this incident and knew these individuals personally. And it was a, it was a challenge for them. Uh, as I said earlier, it was a challenge for the CEO. It was a challenge for the worker that was burned that came back to work months later, six months later, he couldn't do it. He couldn't do it. So in that instance, we made sure that we had all the support necessary for those involved from a mental health standpoint. Without getting into too, too much detail because that inv investigation is still ongoing and some of it's protected. We as a group wanted to make sure that we fostered a culture from then on where we could challenge each other. And I think one of the problems that we have in psychological safety, a lot of times we're pushing it off on management, but many times it's how you and I interact, Dr. Daniels. Mm -hmm. You know, we work close together, we're friends, but you're doing something that's at risk and I don't feel comfortable. I mean, me and you can talk about football, we can talk about these things, but 
I, I have a problem. You know, I'm a grown man. You're a grown man. I, I, am I really going to tell you what you're doing is unsafe or am I going to look the other way and ignore it? Right. And that could have been a causal factor in this instance. So we had to get beyond that. We had to create an atmosphere and tell people it's OK to tell someone else, hey, what you're doing, man, is outside of our risk tolerance. Right. We want you to go home safe. And we want you to go home uh, to your family, just like they sent us to it. And it's one thing to say it. It's a lot harder. You have to work at it. This is a process to get people to change how they relate to each other. So it comes from leadership. Leadership, you know, you can't just have a safety meeting and say, look, I want to have good psychological safety here in our organization. And you guys, if you see somebody doing something unsafe, you feel free to intervene. We're going to try to anticipate this in the design phase of the work. Now go to work and let's all do better. That's not how it works. I wish it did, but it's not. It takes a lot of, a lot of effort, a lot of effort. And that's why I appreciate podcasts like you are having and others because there's not a tremendous amount of training for safety professionals. I mean, safety professionals want to do good. They want to develop strong relationships. They want to to focus on the total person. But until now, and what I mean now, really post-COVID, there hasn't been a lot of information about how to incorporate psychological health and safety within the safety management system uh, and to treat the psychological health as important as the physical health of an employee. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That I, and we may have talked about this, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, people do safety related things for one of three reasons. Either there's some, you know, as you chatted uh, earlier about there's some moral imperative to them. It, it's important to them. It means something to for whatever reason, Either they've got a history, they've had someone else get injured, they've seen it, whatever, but they just feel this is the right thing to do. The second reason people do it, you also talked about is, you know, there's, there's money to be made in being safe. There's production that'll get better if you're safe. There's, so it's that that connection that you mentioned earlier about the financial benefits of safety. And then there's the, you know, there's the, the bottom line is some people do it because they have to. And I believe that's one of the challenges around psychological health and safety is in the United States, we don't have to. And I, I, I believe that is changing. I believe it is changing fast. I believe it's changing fast. There, uh, there's the international standard that's been published. There's information from the International Labor Organization, the World Health Organization, the, the Surgeon General. All these folks are starting to say, and we're starting to realize that the emotional and psychological health of people is just as important, and in some cases may be more important than their physical health. And there's just a lot of work to do. And you, you talked, you just mentioned the fact that safety professionals sometimes don't really think that psychological or emotional part of it is, is as important. But I'm finding that by focusing on psychological safety, you actually find out some of the errors or some of the gaps in your safety management system in general. Because some of those systems, they really, they, they, aren't, as, they aren't as robust as we thought they were. They, they, if, they really aren't. If your safety management system depends on a worker being perfect all the time, you don't have a safety management system. What you have is luck. And some companies are lucky. Now, when you take the fatality number I talked about, between five and 6,000 a year, but compare that to the Hundreds of millions of man hours that are worked, these are generally isolated instances, right, as a percentage. But I don't like to think people as percentages. I know when it happens to me, I don't care what the percentage risk was, it happened to me. And now it's personalized. It's personalized. But when we look at it, uh, psychological safety and health, I I really believe, set serious injuries and fatalities aside for a moment, and let's just deal with production and quality and employee turnover. We have to acknowledge, us old people, 
I'm old now. I'm over 50. I'm old. I just turned 50. Right? That what's important from a value system to our generation and the generations before us is not the same thing that's important to the generations that's coming behind us. That's neither good nor bad. It just is what it is. Right? Right. They value their personal time. They value meaningful work. They want to be respected, and they will not tolerate disrespect. Now, I was raised where you might get a foot in your tail if you did something, you know, you wasn't supposed to or you weren't moving fast enough. That is not tolerated now, and it shouldn't have been tolerated then. So that's all part of that aspect of creating a wholesome place for people to work. How do you feel from a safety standpoint that people are going to exercise their stop work authority or their stop work obligation if they exist in a culture that doesn't support it? Now, everybody wants to support it when they were right. Oh, Sarah saved us from an explosion. Thank you, Sarah. God bless you, Sarah. You know, you're going to get a promotion and here's a gift card. But if Sarah stopped the job a week later, and she was wrong. She thought the situation warned it, but it was wrong. Do we still celebrate that? Or do we jump on Sarah? We make Sarah feel uncomfortable. Her coworkers rag her. Her supervision rags her. You know, uh, senior executives ignore. Hey, you do that, Sarah will never stop the job again. That's right. Ever again. And That's if right. you want to know where your next accident is, I'm going to tell you where your next accident is. Go out there and find the men and women that are doing the job. They'll tell you where the next accident's going to happen. They know because they are in the process every day. So you got to but safety is about relationships. Psychological safety is somewhat, in my opinion, a component about understanding relationships, the dynamics of relationships, the complexities of human beings that we all come with different experiences and we have different influencers. Work does not exist in a silo. Work is impacted by our past experiences, our present experiences, fatigue factors. You know, a lot of times when we talk talking about fatigue, we, we always put that in with, with work rest schedules. Well, that's not necessarily the only factor that goes, goes along with people being tired, being fatigued. When you think about other influencers, is that person going through something outside of work? 50% of marriages end in divorce. I'm divorced. You don't think when I was going through my divorce, that was the most stressful time in my life? Mm. You know, so your system cannot be based on people being 100% perfect. So how do I develop a system outside of that? <laughs> I am a huge fan of prevention through design. We talked about you know, why did that person not wear gloves? Let's design something where they don't have to wear gloves. Or if they take their gloves off, it doesn't end in an amputation. Okay? That's that's the future of safety, I think. And sometimes when we think of prevention through design, we think of prevention through design only in the concept of designing a machine or some type of engineering control. But Hazards are best controlled when we design the work. Think about the work processes. And too many times, this has been my experience, we do no pre-job planning. We send employees out there and we expect them with a JSA to identify all the hazards, to come up with all the controls. And if they could do that, what would we need you and I as safety professionals before? We wouldn't even need management. You don't need right. management. These people can do it all on. We just need dispatchers and billing. Right. But obviously, we need management. We need that experience. We need to try to control hazards. We're designing the work with a consideration that there is a human being involved and human beings make mistakes. In a well-designed system, the fact that somebody did not turn a valve on or off should not result in catastrophe. Yes, yes, yes. You gonna get me fired up now? <laughs> <laughs> this, this, well, this, this is this is why this is why I have you here. So uh, let, let, let's you know let's for a second. Uh, do you think we can have a job hazard uh, assessment or analysis that focuses on 
uh, the potential that the worker will be bullied, for example. That would be outstanding. <laughs> so there's a lot of that. Look, there's a lot of that that goes on. And we call it just messing with the guy. I was just messing with the guy. Sure. And, sure. and look, Dr. Daniels, I'm not proud of it. You know, I grew up eventually. But, <laughs> uh, you know, back when I was in the Navy, they call it hazing now. And it's not tolerated. Mm -hmm. But we were just trying to be funny at right. the expense of someone else. Right. You know, no, we, sometimes we were the butt of the joke. Sometimes they were the butt of the joke. But what we found in my maturity from that is sometimes that has severe psychological impacts on people that really affect their performance. Mm. Okay. Mm. And then only after the fact, when something happens, do we try to attribute, well, maybe we, 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 we help cause and set up that situation. You know, uh, I would like to see, cause I don't see it now psychological health considerations in the hazard assessments. Typically, the only thing we see is fatigue. Right. Okay. But there's so much more that goes into that, that uh, assessment. Mm -hmm. um, when we're designing the work, okay, let's look at the opportunities for error, human error, human error. You know, s saying, I'm going I'm to borrow Dr. Trevor Klett's um, he was a professor down at Texas A&M. He's probably the father of process safety management. I'm going to borrow one of his sayings. Okay. Saying all accidents are due to human error is like saying all falls are due to gravity. <laughs> it's true, but it's not very helpful, is it? Right. So when we're designing work, when we're planning work for individuals to do, let's look at the, the and anticipate that people are going to make a mistake. People are going to make mistakes. James Junkin makes mistakes, right? But right. typically, this is an attribution we make post-accident. Yes. Yes. Without understanding all the influences. So right. my philosophy, my recommendation is when you're designing work, you know who knows the work best? The people that do it. Right. Right. The people that do it. Yeah, I there, there there's a part of me, and, and I, I don't uh, – not – there are folks who would disagree with me when I say this, but I'm not sure if I believe that all of these are even mistakes. I think that people generally do what they believe is in their best interest at the time with the information that they have. That's right. And, and so I didn't intend to it's it's they didn't anticipate that outcome. That was the issue. They did it expecting one thing, but they just got something else. And so the question is, how do we better anticipate what the outcome is going to be and plan for the potential outcomes? It's so in future studies, this is getting off into a little bit of a rabbit trail here. They have what's called uh, the cone of plausibility. So there's the present and then there's a future. Things in the future are going to go really well and some things are going to go really bad. But we sometimes we only plan for one thing. And if that doesn't happen, we it's like we're lost when well, we really should be planning for scenarios. That if we do this, this could happen, but that also could happen. And there are all kinds of considerations that we've planned for, you know, certainly the most likely. You can't plan for everything, but there's some things, particularly in certain industries, it's happened enough. So there have been enough workers who have felt that they couldn't speak up in that environment for you to plan on how to do that a little bit better in the future. If you do an investigation, someone is injured and the culture says we don't speak up. Why is it that we simply go back to doing things the same way, waiting for that to happen the next time? And uh, that, so I, I, that's actually one of those areas. And, and, and frankly, for, you know, if you run across people who need some help in that area, have them call me. <laughs> be, be, because there is, a, there is a link between our traditional focus on safety and the, 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 the whole mental health, emotional health. That there's a space in the middle where psychological health and safety actually fits. Because I'm not a mental health professional at all. I'm a safety guy. That's what I am. But I'm not a traditional safety guy either because I didn't come up in heavy industry. I came up in fire rescue service and came up in the public sector. But safety is safety is safety. It's really an adjective. It's about a perception. It, it, it is. If I don't feel safe, it's not safe for me. That's the issue. And that's, that's what, you know, I think is really important for, for all of us to focus on is safety means different things to different people. So in our system, we have to acknowledge that, that it's right. not just 
one, two, three, four. For some people, it was one, two, eight, nine for them. And, and, and we have to be designing systems that are safe for the people that are in that system, not the ones who worked here 10 years ago or 20 or 50 years ago. And, and I, I just, I really, you know, it's really important what you were saying that we have a, every, all generations are new when they first show up, but they're really just a different generation. It. It ceased, it's not bad. It's just different. That's it's all. Different. It's just different. And how do we create a safe environment for them? How do we create a safe environment for them? So uh, in, in, in our final few moments here, if, you know, a, as you're having conversation, particularly in, you know, in the oil and gas industry, what kind of advice are you giving folks around this holistic approach to keeping, uh, to creating a safe environment for folks to work in? Well, I think also one of the things I, I really challenge people to do is words mean things. Words mean things. But actions are more impactful. But we got to get the terminology right. Right? So saying safety is our number one goal. Well, goals change. Saying safety is a value. Oh, I want to have a good safety culture. And I don't believe in that. Okay? You don't have a safety culture, a procurement culture, an operations culture. You just got a culture. Okay, this is our organizational culture for everything. Safety is not in a silo. Safety is here with all of us. Begin trying to create a system in which culture is a part of it where we are engaging workers. Now, it's one thing to say every safety management system and foundation is built upon worker participation. But what does that mean? What does that mean? And to quote the great Dr. Linda Martin, it just depends. It means different things for different organizations. So my advice to, to CEOs, my advice to business owners, get out of your office. Get out of your office and go be with the people. Because the higher up the chain of command you go, the less you know what's going on in your organization. And practice decentralized command, which means... Not everything has to come from the front office. Empower your people, still have accountability, give them the strategic vision you want for your organization, and you'll be surprised at how, how passionate they'll be and their ingenuity will amaze you and that'll affect production and, and quality and workplace safety and all this goes together. Listen to your people, empower your people, Create that safe psychological environment that you have. Be forgiving of mistakes. Now, I'm not talking about mistakes of character. I'm talking about mistakes. We tried it, didn't work out. We learned from it and we moved on. That's how you could create a learning culture. That's how you create a culture of continuous improvement. And that creates involvement and employee participation and should be, create a workplace that values the psychological safety and health of its workers because we're identifying those hazards and putting controls in when we design the work itself. Wow. Wow. Uh, so those who were listening or watching us on YouTube, uh, you just got some free advice there. <laughs> <laughs> you just got some free and very important advice. So, so, so James, as we, as we wrap up here, if people wanted to, uh, they want to, have more conversation with you. What's what's the best way to to catch up with James and 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 follow what he's doing? What's the best way to do that? We uh, my LinkedIn uh, page is a great page to interact. James Junkin, J U N K I N C S P, bunch of other letters. It should pop up. CEO at Mariner Gulf Consulting and Services. Our our LinkedIn page at MarinerGulf.com. Our website. Mar uh, well, not MarinerGulf.com on LinkedIn, just MarinerGulf Consulting and Services on LinkedIn, MarinerGulf.com on the web. Uh, I'm, I'm on there pretty regular. I love to have conversations. We put out, uh, Dr. Martin and I put out something called Safety Bites every couple of weeks. It's just a short conversation about safety. We like to get there with two safety nerds talking about the issues of the day. So <laughs> reach out to us, join the conversation. We'd love to hear from you. Absolutely. Well, thanks. Thanks very much for this. Uh, wow. Uh, not only uh, 
you know, informative conversation, but actually an inspiring one. As I said, one of the things about you that I really appreciate is your passion for this topic. Uh, and it just, it, it comes through the camera. It comes through uh, your words. It comes through you know, just everything about you that you are really serious about this. I, uh, I rather enjoy being around people that are serious about stuff. <laughs> I, 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 I do because, you know, uh, yeah, I, I'm an old guy as well. And, uh, but I, and, and neither of us got to have more birthdays by not being serious about, you know, about safety because we've both been, you know, in different aspects of, of, of hazardous work. We've been around hazardous work. And I, I'm a believer that you can still live a really long life and, and I'm a healthy one and still be involved in hazardous work. I, I think it's doable. And I'm not willing to accept that it's not possible. So that's why I always enjoy talking to you. And and uh, and I walk away from our conversations juiced up to do a little bit more. So so again, thanks thanks so much for joining me today. And for all of you, for those of you who have tuned in either on YouTube, uh, you've uh, stumbled across our website, you've picked us up wherever you get your podcast. We we're just so thankful that you took time out to to listen and to watch uh, this episode. And uh, stay with us, uh, stick with us. Every week, we have these kinds of conversations with, uh, with passionate uh, folks just like James. And uh, we'll look forward to uh, our next conversation on uh, the Psych Health and Safety USA podcast. Thanks very much for watching and listening. You've been listening to the Psych Health and Safety USA podcast. To stay up to date with the best content on workplace mental health in America, Subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts and join the Flourish DX community at www.flourishdx.com.